Right folks, here we are again. It's Friday night. Thanks so much for tuning in. And this week we're going to be dealing with problems associated with the hip joint. Now this is very common. I deal with it most days of my work in life. And lots of you have sent in some great questions. So thanks so much. We're going to round them up as best we can. We're going to answer as many as we can in a shortish period of time. Here we go. Right. Well, it's not surprising that the most common question that I've been asked about hip joints is concerning hip dysplasia, which means abnormality of development of the hip joint. It can happen in a dog or a cat. It's most common in young, large breed growing dogs. And you may not see it as a, a single leg lameness because often they're affected on both sides, which means they may just be stiff rather than lame on one leg. And what happens is the tissues that normally make the head of the femur exactly congruent with the socket, which is called the acetabulum, don't work as well as they should. And as a result, the hip joint gets loose and the head rubs on that socket. The socket itself fills in and gets very shallow. The joint capsule gets stretched and inflamed, creating new bone here and around the femoral neck. And inflammation happens within the joint as well, which is called arthritis. Sometimes the socket can be extremely shallow, as in this situation here. And then if the head is over here rubbing on that, that can be very painful with rubbing away of cartilage, inflammation within the joint and stretching of those tissues. So hip dysplasia can be a very painful condition. And lots of you have asked good questions about this. We've got Miss Trude uh, asking the question about what type of movement or preferences in lying down. Uh, a dog displays that could indicate hip pain. I've got two fellow Westie lovers, Joanne Taylor on Twitter, asking about her 11 year old Westie showing uh, stiffness and reluctance to jump on the sofa. And Samantha Butler on Facebook asking about a seven year old Westie who limps on the right hind leg after lying down. Now here's the thing. If a dog is limping on one back leg, yes, it could be a hip problem, but it could also be a knee problem. It could be an ankle problem. And young large breed dogs could have a cartilage problem in the ankle. Uh, a middle-aged Westie could have a ruptured cruciate ligament in the knee. So if you're in doubt, a veterinary professional needs to help you to make that diagnosis. Generally, hip dysplasia is an insidious problem. So it'll be gradual onset and most patients will be stiff rather than overtly holding the leg up. Most of them will be exercise intolerant. They won't want to go for a run, perhaps the way they used to. They may be particularly stiff uh, after doing exercise, then lying down and then getting up again. It's unusual in my experience for them to whimper uh, or to meow in the case of a cat, unless the hip joint is jarred. So remember with hip dysplasia, it's insidious gradual onset lameness. And it's up to us to be vigilant about our best friend so that they're not in pain for too long. All right, well, following on from how to spot hip pain and hip dysplasia, there's the inevitable questions about treatment. Uh, Helen Applegren Kane on Facebook has a 14 year old cat with hip pain being treated medically, wonders what else she can do to help. Uh, Joanne Hayward on Facebook is asking about a four year old border collie with bilateral hip dysplasia currently having hydro and she wants to know what she can do to help him further and when to go for a referral. Well, here's the thing, not every patient is the same. And the most important thing I think is weight management. It's important to keep the body weight down. Uh, because the more body weight there is to carry, the more painful the hips. A judicious exercise plan, of course, physiotherapy, including laser therapy and hydrotherapy as well, can be very helpful to maintain range of motion and to maintain muscle mass. Uh, mainstay of medical treatment is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's lots of those and it's important that we get our animal friends out of pain. Another thing that can, we can do is give nutritional supplements containing chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine, and green lip muscle extract, but be careful what you buy. They're not all the same. Another thing that we can do is inject the joint. Uh, I tend to not use steroids to inject. Um, what I tend to do is use biologic products like uh, platelet-rich plasma, PRP, or fat-derived stem cells. The thing is, it's really important because it's your money and you're spending it, that you know what's in that product. So it needs to be a product with proven efficacy and you need to ask the question, how many anti-inflammatory stem cells are in that injection? How has it been cultured? Have they been shown to be very actively anti-inflammatory? How many platelets are in that injection? What is the cocktail that you're injecting that I'm spending my money on? Can be very effective 
in the short to medium term, repeat injections generally required. And then of course there's surgery. I'm a surgeon, but surgery is not always indicated. Having said that, uh, dogs and cats can do very well from hip surgery. And often it can get an animal out of pain for a decade Hip replacement used to not be available for dogs under one year of age, but I've published a paper on this and we've shown that the complication rate is not higher than in older dogs. So if your hip is really bad in a six to 12 month old dog, hip replacement is sometimes a viable option. Even in cats, hip replacement is a very viable option and we've done dozens of those. If the hip joint is still viable and you've got a, a socket which can still hold the head of the femur, then in young dogs, you can chop the pelvis here and rotate it out over the femoral head to grab it again. But the bottom line in all of that is that it's not the same for every animal. And our moral responsibility, our ethical responsibility is to try and do our best for our animal friend, to get the best advice we can and to shop around. It's your animal friend. So it's got to be your choice. And I believe in all of the options, all of the time, for all of the animals. So it's up to you. And of course, this leads us to the inevitable conclusion, which is what is the right thing to do for my pet, for my dog, for my cat? Uh, I often think about the four E's, which are evidence, efficacy, education, and ethics. For whatever technique we use, whether it's medicine or surgery, we need evidence of efficacy for that technique. We need to educate people that all of this stuff is available and it's your choice. It's your money, it's your friend, it's your choice. But most importantly, ethics. What is ethically right for each individual animal? And it's different for every animal because you can do a total hip replacement in a seven month old dog or a seven year old dog and both can be absolutely the, the right thing to do for that patient. You have all different kinds of hip replacements. So for example, you can have bone growing into trabecular metal here, uh, which is an uncemented hip replacement. You can have a cemented hip replacement where cement goes around the cup and around the stem. And you can have hip replacements as well for teeny tiny animals like small dogs and pussy cats. Look at the size of that, tiny. And all of those can be the right thing to do, but it's different for every patient. I've got a question here for Susie Carter on Facebook. It says her eight-year-old dog has just been diagnosed with hip dysplasia and asks whether total hip replacement is out of the question because of his age. No, it's an individual thing. Every animal has an individual judgment process. So I've certainly done hip replacements on eight-year-old dogs. Uh, Caroline Hooker on Facebook, I asked about her Maine Coon cat, who I love Maine Coons. I've got one called Ricochet. Uh, double hip dysplasia, oh, poor cat. Being treated medically, but wonders if she should consider further treatment. Well, when I graduated, femoral head and neck excision was all that I could offer, which is chopping the femoral head off and just leaving no joint. And it's been proven scientifically that the force plate measurements, uh, how much ground reaction force they're putting through that foot, is superior with hip replacement than it is with femoral head and neck excision. So look, at the end of the day, that's your, your choice. It's your patient, your animal friend, it's your choice. Uh, Andy uh, Magdalene has asked whether there's an ideal age to consider total hip replacement. Again, no. If your animal friend is managing well on medicine, then that's fine. If not, you can consider hip replacement. A uh, hip replacement for us would be a routine operation, it takes about one hour, uh, skin to skin. And I, I like hip replacement because it gets a dog or a cat out of pain in a couple of weeks. And most of these animals will return to running around uh, after about six weeks. Uh, there are risks, of course, of course, with any operation there are risks, but I do believe it's a good operation. But here's the thing, every single case is unique and it's your animal friend. So you've got to make that decision in consultation with a veterinary professional holding your hand. And just because it's possible, does not make it the right thing to do. We have a moral responsibility to ethically do the right thing for our animal friends. And I guess the, the last thing I wanted to say is you have to take the whole animal into consideration, not just the hip joint. You need to take a holistic view of that particular dog or cat. What is right in those circumstances for that family and for that animal with that age and those other comorbidities, whether there's arthritis somewhere else or they have a medical problem, for example. And final, finally, um, it's your animal friend, so it's your choice. And I encourage people to get a first opinion, a second opinion, a third opinion. 
because it's your money and you want your animal friend to have an excellent quality of life. Our job as veterinary professionals is to get that animal as comfortable as possible. And at the end of the day, all of the options for all the animals all of the time, your animal, your choice, and hopefully together we do a good job and give them an excellent quality of life. Right, I hope you found that helpful. It was certainly enjoyable for me condensing all of that information into a few minutes. You've sent in some brilliant questions. Thank you so much for that, especially you vet students out there. It's great that you're getting something from this as well. And for me, it's wonderful that we're all sharing experiences, especially during the time of lockdown when isolation is an issue. And our animal friends are always there for us, so it's important we are there for them as well. I'm going to put out another question uh, next Monday. If you like this, tell us that you want more of it and then hopefully we'll help you out with some more questions and answers uh, next Friday. In the meantime, give your animal friend a big hug from me. Have a fabulous weekend. See you next week.